There will be spoilers ahead for Love, Death, and Robots volumes 1 through 2. Okay, so Netflix did one of my favorite things that they tend to do sometimes, which is releasing a season of a sci-fi anthology series. So like a kid waiting for Santa, or whatever the f*** this thing was, I was up at 3am so I could watch all of volume 2 the moment it came out on Netflix, and I have not stopped watching it since. With that said, Pop Squad, an episode adapted from the short story with the same name written by Paolo Bacigalupi, is my favorite episode of the entire season. So I wanted to quickly talk about and analyze this episode. Detective Briggs works on the Pop Squad, where he's tasked with raiding hideouts where people are illegally harboring and raising kids. His job specifically is to eliminate, or pop, those kids, as in, as in kill them. In this future, everyone receives reju treatments. A clear play on the word rejuvenation, as the treatment restores and maintains the subject's youth. So the citizens who receive reju essentially live forever. I mean, theoretically, they can still die from getting like hit by a bus or something. The downside is that with everyone living forever, no one can have kids. This is primarily done for population control and the fact that their planet has been ravaged by climate change. Thanks to an additive in Riju, it prevents everyone from having kids naturally. So you have to stop taking Riju in order to procreate. But that subsequently takes away your ability to live forever. There is a clear wealth gap in this world. And it's shown to us with imagery that looks straight out of altered carbon. The rich live above the clouds and the poor are left in the rainy decrepit slums down below. After the first raid, Detective Briggs attends an event hosted by Maria Aloni, this woman right here, who profited heavily from the global warming mitigation for New York City, and is one of the symphony's high donors. Maria drags Alice away to deliver a speech in praise of Alice's performance in Tologo's new concerto. In the original short story of Pop Squad, Alice is referred to as Tologo's diva viola, his prize. Tologo and Hua Chang supposedly trained Alice for 20 years to perfect such a performance. Alice became the key to Tologo and Chang defeating Benini, who previously held the title as the greatest, in what seems to be more than a century-long competition. During her speech in the original short story, Marie claims, I've made several calls to Benini, and it is more than apparent that he has no answer to our challenge. So I expect the next 80 years are ours, and Alice's. To commemorate the end of Benini, Nini's era, Maria gives Alice a dinosaur, claiming that she is the slayer of dinosaurs, a symbol of how she helped remove an old dinosaur, Benini, from his throne, as Benini was top dog for more than a century but has now become antiquated. This antique, previously known as a toy, looks just like the one the child had from the raid earlier in the episode. When Alice and Briggs are at the Riju clinic for the more wealthy citizens, the green liquid gets put into Alice's system through an IV. During this process, her eyes begin to dilate, as they appear to be full of life. She experiences a high from this medication as she feels more alive than ever before. After the scene with Briggs and Alice in the car, we cut to Briggs leaving another raid. In the original short story, we're told about this raid a little bit. How Briggs couldn't handle the ear-piercing screaming and crying of an infant, so he decided to put a bullet in it right in front of the mother. Even though they are told not to pop the kids in front of the parents, or as the police call them, breeders. The mother screams at Briggs, yelling all sorts of derogatory terms, but what really gets to him is when she claims he has dead eyes. Briggs still has Alice's award in his car, and notices that the tag on the green dinosaur reads Ipswich Collectibles, so he then goes to investigate this antique shop. Oh, and by the way, in the episode The Drowned Giant, a similar looking storefront with the same name appears in the background as the narrator is driving through the town. Anyway, Briggs is at the antique shop, and he notices a woman with a stain on her shoulder, the kind of stain no normal person would have in their world unless unless they were raising kids. From the shop, he follows the woman back to her house. She chooses to raise the kid on the edge of their society, away from all the new spires and superclusters, the last of what's left of the suburbs as this area is on its way to being fully consumed by the jungle. Which is smart, because those raising kids in the city have to worry about the neighbors hearing crying or screaming. I mean, the first kids that we meet haven't seen outside in probably forever, because they can't risk 
neighbors or other civilians seeing them. So subsequently, their apartments are in disarray, and are a complete unbearable mess. In the first raid we experience, Briggs opens the fridge to see expired lettuce and weighted piles of nutrition supplement sacks. There's nothing fresh, and everything is processed, because trips to get food are most likely few and far apart. A question that's asked in this episode, and in the original short story, is why would someone want to have kids in this world? Y'all remember when I was talking about the wealthy earlier in this video? Well, something that's hinted at throughout the episode is that with everyone living these endless lives, the rich stay rich and the poor stay poor. They've essentially pressed pause on time, change, evolution, and anything new. It's interesting, in the short story, Briggs describes the Riju as a clear liquid, but explains he's always thought it should be fizzy and green for growing things. And in this episode, they chose to make the liquid green, instead of clear like it should be, intentionally making the Riju the same color as the dinosaur and the jungle that surrounds the house sheltering an unregistered child. The use of green helps emphasize that their society is hoarding life and depriving it from the next generation. With no growth, life becomes stale, especially for those living more average lives. Living almost becomes another form of prison as most of these people are in a state of purgatory. The parents find fulfillment in bringing another life into this world, finding a new sense of purpose. They may have the chance to live forever, but no one is actually living. The woman at the end only found that life was worth living when she knew the time she had with her daughter was finite, claiming she'll remember all those moments of Melanie growing up because she knows she won't have many. When talking about her daughter, the woman tells Briggs, I love seeing things through her little eyes. They're so bright, they're so full of life, not dead like yours. At the end of the original short story, Briggs ends up living. He leaves Melanie and her mother alone and narrates, I run from my cruiser, splashing through mud and vines and wet. And for the first time in a long time, the rain feels new. I actually prefer the alteration made for this episode where Briggs ends up dying. Not because I'm morbid, but that's definitely a factor. We focus our attention on his dead eyes from the start of the episode. When Briggs first enters the hideout, an officer scans his eye with a harsh red beam. The color red is representative of the system that prevents this growth. A lot of the police officers wear masks that have red eyes. The detectives wear red. Alice wears a red dress the night of her performance, and red illuminates the crime scenes. Briggs's dead eyes are indicative of the fact that he's been dead inside for a long time. It's as if he already knew the answer to his own question. Like the other parents, he's become tired of the same old thing. This is how the episode begins, and this is how it ends. Briggs looks up to the rain, feeling something new, and for once his dead eyes appear to be full of life, mirroring Alice's reaction to the Riju from earlier in the episode. Briggs protected Melanie by shooting the other detective and getting himself shot in the process. He traded his infinite life for something temporary, but new. And those are all the thoughts I had today about Pop Squad. I'm actually unfamiliar with the writer behind this, but I'm very impressed by his work so far. I will definitely be checking out more of his short stories later. It's just like, ah, oh gosh, this episode's just so cool. I like the Blade Runner-esque design of everything. I would definitely like to see more sci-fis like this that indulge with retrofuturism. Okay, so I'm gonna go watch more Love, Death, and Robots. So if you love Love, Death, and Robots, or you think it's, like, pretty good, or you think it's okay, subscribe to this channel because I'm making more Love, Death, and Robots videos all week. So as always, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in my next Love, Death, and Robots video.